income is, is too high. I'm willing to lose out on profit, just not to lose out on, on losses. For that person, you're going to want to look at that um, worst case scenario, the, the, the minimum uh, scenario, right? or the minimap scenario. Right? Whereas, um, if you're looking at someone saying, hey, I have a lot of money to, to invest, I'm going to do it this year over year, and if I lose money in any given year, I know in the long run I'm going to make the most out, maybe the expected value in that case is what you should look at, because this is, the, the, you're never going to get exactly this expected value. You're not getting 42500 right? There's no one of these that has 42500 here. Right, the whole expected value is if you repeat this a bunch of times, the average that you would get over that bunch of times is 42500 right? So the person who's able to repeat this over and over and over again is going to benefit most from that expected value. Right? So that's why I'm saying you have to look at what the value of the decision maker is, what the, what their what they care about, what is important to them, what they have access to, what the implications of that decision are, and match the decision strategies that value these things most closely, closely to what their values are, and those are the ones that you should um, highlight. Okay. Um, I'm going to... Um, skip over now um, questions D and E because they were just a matter of changing some of these percentages here. Okay, so I think if you got this, um, you could get those pretty straightforward. Uh, but what I want to talk about now is uh, a concept that is uh, the, um, it will end up being the cost of perfect information. So what I want you to imagine here for a second is that you actually could predict the future. Okay? If, if you could predict the future, decision making would be a pretty simple endeavor, <laughs> wouldn't it? Right? What should I do? Well, let's look and see what would happen if I made this choice or this choice. So we're going to make a table just like this. This is our regret table. But we're going to make a, a separate table that says, what if we did have perfect information and we knew what the future was going to hold? What would we do? Okay? And it, it's similar to the thinking to, to this regret table. So I'm going to repeat this. Decision one, decision two, decision three. Okay? So, um, we know, we've already talked about when we made this regret table, that if, if we have weak demand for, for both of these, um, then our return is going to be um, 20, 22, and 25. Oh, I have my notes. So if we have weak both, we're going to get 20 from this choice, we're going to get 25 from this choice, and 22 from this choice. So since we can see into the future, we know, just like we talked about with the regret, what would we do? We would go ahead and choose this decision. So this is going the opposite way of the re regret. If I know this is what the future holds, this is what I should do. Okay? <coughs> if this is what our demand is, what should we do? If we know we're going to have weak Riesling and strong Chardonnay, 
What should we do? Choose decision one. Why? Because it makes 70,000. It makes 70,000. And the other two make... Um, 25 and 26. 25 and 26. Okay. So what about if we have strong Riesling and weak Chardonnay? What should we do? Strong Riesling, weak Chardonnay, what should we do? We want to only plant Riesling, why? So it will give us 45k. It will give us 45k. What will we get in the other two? 20. Okay, and then finally, if we had strong demand for both, what would we do? Chardonnay. Because it would return? 70. But these would return? 45. Okay. Okay. So that's where the perfect information comes from. If we knew what the future held, we would make these choices. Okay? So, if we look at if, uh, what the expected value would be of making these choices, what we can do is we can multiply now the probability that each of these four events happen times the return we would get by being able to, to look into that future and make the perfect decision. So what's the probability again that both of them are weak? You can look over, over here, right? What's the probability that both are weak? 5%. 5%. So we would do 25 times 5%. Plus, what's the probability that we have weak Riesling but strong Chardonnay? 25%. So we would do 70 times 25%. And we keep going. 45 times what's the probability of strong Riesling but weak Chardonnay? 50. 50%. And if they're both strong, um, 20%? So if we knew what the future held, our expected value return in that case, if we multiply all those together, would be 55.3, okay? which is better than the 42.5 because some, sometimes we would make a mistake here. But here, we're never making a mistake. So this is called the cost of perfect information because we can subtract from the perfect choice our expected value choice of, in this case, 42.5, and that's how much it costs us to not be able to know the future. Okay, because we don't know what demand is, we're losing out on almost $13,000. Okay? The reason why this is important is because sometimes the future is more predictable than others. Right? There are people whose job specialty is to forecast what consumer demand is going to be, to, to forecast even what the weather is going to be, so what our uh, farms are going to produce, to, to forecast what uh, relationships between countries are, and so what the trade uh, disputes may or may not be, and so therefore what the cost of goods to trade between these company, countries are. Right? If these people are doing their job, they are closer to this perfect information than just a wild Yes, right? And so you might be willing to pay 
a market study analyst to say, hey, can you give me a more realistic idea of what the future is, especially if you are very uncertain about what it is. I don't know what the likelihood of um, these situations are, and, and depending upon how close that market um, study, market analysis is going to be to actual reality, you might be willing to pay up to this difference here. Because that market study can tell you, oh yeah, this is what's going to happen next year. We've got you know insider information, or um, you know we 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 you know that would probably not be very legal, right? <laughs> um, but you you know if someone says, yeah, I can tell you with a hundred percent certainty, and you even believe them that they can tell you what the demand for the grapes are going to be, well, for your vineyard. But they say, it'll cost you $25,000. This tells you that that market study is not worth it, even if it's 100% correct. Right? Because you, you're only um, likely, you're only able to gain that $13,000 between what you would do without that information and what if it was 100% correct. And so as, as a result, it allows you to inform should you do that kind of a market study to get a better handle, a more certain uh, idea of, of what uh, events are going to take place outside your control uh, to um, help you make a, a, an even more complete solution. All right, I think, I think you have to use this in, in a future assignment. I forget if it's due Friday or due Monday. But this is something that you will need to do. It's with um, a, <clears throat> you're representing a real estate company and you're trying to decide what kind of a, a housing complex to build. Um, a small, medium, or large. Um, and you have to decide uh, whether what site building you're going to do based on how much demand there is going to be. I think it's like a senior citizen's facility or something like that. You know, how much demand is going to be for, for condos in this, in this unit. Right? And so one of the questions is, so-and-so is willing to offer you, uh, you know, a market analysis and give you better information. Is it worth it? You have to compute what the cost of perfect information is to be able to figure out is it worth it to get that? And you probably don't want to spend this all, right? Because it's probably not perfect. It's getting you closer to perfect. So you only want to spend probably some percentage of this increase. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Let's look at the other problem for today. Uh, problem 12. Okay, this is the um, building a runway example. What, uh, what decision are you trying to make? I practically said it already, right? What are you trying to decide? Whether to build the runway or not. So there are two, there's only two options for you, right? You build or you don't build, right? Let's start down here. If we don't build, how many states of nature are there? How many things outside of your control are there? There's one thing outside your control and it's going to result in how many states of nature? Two, right? What, what are those? Uh, how about here? If we build, how many things are outside of our control now? There's two, right? It's both the decision that DRI makes and the decision that 
each AEC made. <coughs> right? So there's a total of how many different states of nature when we combine those together? There's four total ones, right? Because as far as we can tell, these decisions are independent from each other. Right? DRI and AEC are not saying, well, if you go, I'll go, and, and so forth. Um, they, they're making the decision. So uh, we have both, and we have none here. We have only DRI and only um, AEC here. All right, so what is the expected outcome if both come? Because we built. What's the expected outcome here? Yeah, there's a 30% chance that will make $600,000. How about if only DRI comes? comes? <coughs> With 50. And if neither come, because we built the runway, and it's not like our people dream. Right? Alright, so how about down here? If we don't build the runway and DRI doesn't come? Or they do come. They make we make four hundred and fifty, but if they don't come, Zero. no harm, no fall in that case, right? We didn't spend any money, so they didn't decide to come. So we can do the same thing we did on the last one, right? We can take, I didn't write them down, but we can take our percentages, multiply them by our outcomes, and get an expected value at each one of these. So um, in this case, you should have gotten uh, 255,000, the expected value, and 270,000, right? And again, the expected value points to not building the runway. I want to point out your in this problem, unlike the previous problem, the authors are very careful to point out how skittish the mayor is. Right? The, the, the mayor is especially hesitant about um, losing money. Right? Um, so that would also <coughs> indicate that maybe we should look at more than just the expected value. In this case, if the mayor is skittish, what kind of decision strategy most closely aligns with, with that kind of... Uh, Thinking. Minimax regret. Minimax regret, or just minimax in general, right? We're worried about losing money. And so if we did minimax, we would also end up here because the worst case scenario here is nothing, whereas the worst case scenario here is losing two hundred thousand dollars. And it would be really hard for for him in this case to explain that to his constituents about why he wasted two hundred thousand dollars of their, their hard earned tax money. So this is just another example of us not just saying, oh, well, this is expected value, we're done. But having to look at um, what fits the scenario best. Um, questions about either of these two problems? Yes? Is is there a right answer? No. <laughs> yeah. What I would expect from you is to, to include these and say, my analysis in, by looking at all these is that this is best because, and so it's that it's supported. It's not that this is the right answer, but it's that you can do a well-reasoned 
response about why this is better than another solution. And it should include not just one decision making strategy, but a plethora of them. your notes from Monday, I want to start to try to introduce another idea that kind of um, ties in with the idea of cost of perfect information that we're trying to say, you know, what if we're wrong or how can we make our, our decision better? You'll remember earlier in the semester, we talked about sensitivity analysis. We can do sensitivity analysis in a decision-making uh, scenario as well. Um, in these scenarios, usually what we're not certain about is the probabilities of these, these different actions. So we're, um, if, I'm going to focus on, because it's hard to do it uh, otherwise, uh, a scenario where there's two states uh, of nature that we can choose from. Okay, so somewhere in our tree, we've got a situation where, where, where we, something um, good happens and, or something bad happens. Right? So it's very generic here. Um, and we think the good thing happens 60% of the time and the bad thing happens 40% of the time. But we're really kind of uh, I think 60%, 40%. Um, and so when we compute the expected value of this node right here, there's a lot of uncertainty that kind of resides in there. Um, and so the, when we talked about sensitivity analysis before, we asked, you know, what if we were wrong about the coefficient in our objective value? Or what if we were wrong about the right-hand side value in our linear equations? This time we're asking, what if we're wrong about these percentages right here? When does being wrong lead us to a, a different solution? Uh, one thing I want to point out is if this has a probability of p, then this is going to be 1 minus p, because we only have two options and they have to add up to 100%. Okay? Uh, so, if, if, this has an, if this has an outcome of uh, 100, and this has an outcome of, of 20, if we, were, if we knew for certain the probabilities, we would say that's 100 times 60% plus 20 times 40%, and we would get an expected value of um, 60 uh, plus 8, 68, right? That would be our uh, expected value right there. Um, but if we didn't know, we could plug in the, these parameters instead. We could do 100 times P, 